All right, incoming response video. Hello, hello, and welcome back to A Bit Fruity, the show where we don't really care if you have sex in the United States Senate hearing room, because on the list of the most egregious humanitarian violations that take place in there, consensual gay sex isn't even making the top 50. Well, it makes us look bad, though, doesn't it? But you go on to prove that uh, you don't care how LGBT people are perceived. You, you don't care how badly we're perceived. As long as there's still some form of progress being made, none of that matters. And it's just like, yeah, it, 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 it matters quite a bit, but you, you want to, to put your head in the sand. So. so last week, someone on Instagram sent me this essay called Annoying Queer People Are Not Why We Are Oppressed, which was about the way queer people police each other's behavior casting out the weirdest and freakiest among us, and how we tend to cling to this belief that being less annoying, you know, less flaming, less out and in people's faces will make it more likely that the rest of the world will stop discriminating against us. I think most people accept that freaks exist of all types, of all sexualities, of all, just all sorts of mindsets. There are freaks all over the place. The problem is that so many people are trying to make something that isn't normal appear as normal. There's nothing wrong with not being normal. Normal is pretty damn boring. It's the politics, it's the ideology, it's the activism mostly. This mindset is one that I've at times adopted personally. It's one that I think about literally all the time. It's one that people online have used when they try to make the case that like I and people like me are like bad representations for the community because we're too flamboyant or something. People being flamboyant is only a very, very small percentage of what people have a problem with. And it's a topic, respectability politics, that I've wanted to dig into on this podcast since I started the show. So I reached out to the author. And today we are joined by Devin Price to talk about what it means to be the wrong type of queer person. Again, most of it is about the activism, not just about someone being weird or queer or, or, or a freak or whatever, right? The problem is, again, the politics, the ideology, the, the activism. And a lot of times it's the attitudes. Sometimes people want to blame their attitude on, oh, well, that's just the way I am. And I'm just like, yeah, but... Some attitudes suck. It doesn't matter who it's on. <laughs> it doesn't matter if you're a woman, a man, anything in between. If you have a crappy attitude, that can mess things off too. Those are the things that can make us look bad. Like like the like the, the footage of it, it's ma'am and uh, uh, other people just making this big stink because they got misgendered uh, somewhere, right? Just like yeah, that that makes us look bad. Okay? That makes us look thin-skinned and kind of pathetic. OK, things like that are, are what give us the problems, not just the fact that, that uh, people are freakish, you know, society accepts freaks more now than they ever have. Devin Price is an author of the books Unmasking Autism, Laziness Does Not Exist and Unlearning Shame. Devin Price, welcome to the show, and thank you so much for being here. Hi, Matt. I'm so happy to have this conversation, and I'm so glad it's this is a problem that's been annoying other people as much as me. On a note of fashion, um, I think it's interesting and kind of sad how we're at a point right now where if you want to be fashion forward, you have to wear glasses that everyone's been avoiding for over 30 years. You know, the glasses that you could always get on sale because nobody wanted them. <laughs> <laughs> I want to start today's episode by showing you an image. This is a meme that circulates the internet like kind of a lot, and it usually gets a lot of traction. In this case, it was tweeted recently by a cisgender white gay man named Tyler, uh, who's like a you know conservative influencer on Twitter. He wrote the caption, know the difference, we are not the same. And it's a picture where it's okay, it's split into two sections. On the left, it says LGB. And on the right, it says TQIA plus. And over the LGB part, there is a photo of the gay, recently out gay football player, Carl Nassib. He's like 
hot, hunky, white, all American looking dude. And then over the TQIA plus, it is a picture of Jeffrey Marsh, who is a queer TikTok influencer who makes these like tender TikToks that appeal to like young people who don't have accepting parents. Jeffrey Marsh is a creep who targets children who tries to get them to disassociate from their parents and to talk with him personally instead. And they are visibly androgynous, wearing a dress and eye makeup and have facial hair. Yeah, he's trying to look as creepy as possible. The way that you're supposed to read this image, right, is like LGB people are, you know, normal and we're football players and we can pass in society and we we don't, you know, push anyone's buttons. The image on the left shows that you don't have to be a freak to be gay. As much as this maybe pains you to hear, there are a number of people who don't want to come out of the closet because of the way that activism has become. They don't want to be associated with the TQIA++ side of things that wants to dismantle so many systems that make up this culture and society in general. They don't want to dismantle Western civilization. They don't want to dismantle capitalism. They don't want to do all that. Okay? And when there's this push that, uh, well, if you're gay, you have to be under this umbrella, that makes people not want to come out of the closet at all. So, you know, you, you need to look at all sides of this stuff. You're not going to. You're not going to. And then the TQIA plus people are freaks and we're flamboyant and we're cross-dressing and we're in your face. The in-your-face part has to do with an attitude. You know, someone can be as much of a freak as they want, and if they're not pushing something onto you and saying you're some sort of bigot unless you agree with them on everything, you know, nobody cares. Nobody cares. Be as much of a freak as you want. And there's an obvious connotation here with how you're meant to feel about each of these people. And so I want to get your reaction to this image. God, it like reminds me of things that I used to hear as like a millennial who was like coming up during like the gay marriage fights of the early 2000s. The things people would say about like, I don't care if you're gay as long as you don't shove it in my face. Mm. Like that kind of messaging that is so tired and you'll still sometimes hear. I mean, actually, it's picking up a lot because people are tired of things like rainbow capitalism, you know, the entire month of June. You know, previous to that, we 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 had maybe a Pride Week in in our big city or whatever, but uh, and you know a Pride weekend, a Pride Day, whatever, right? But now it's an entire month, and with rainbow capitalism, nobody can get away from it for an entire month. It's smeared in people's faces. It's sometimes smeared in kids' faces in public elementary schools. You know, people aren't able to get away from it anymore. People feel like it's it's smeared in their faces and in some cases it is you know it's not the same as when people said it before it's actually happening now this idea that some people just how they live and how they present is like shoving it in your face in some way because when people say things like that they see being queer as so other that it feels in their face if you said that 15 years ago i'd agree now no not with the way that the activism is going no no i don't agree at all for somebody to just live. But people like you have no respect for those that just want to live and, and exist in this society. You only have respect for people that want to radically change society. We have to dismantle cis-heteronormativity. We have to dismantle patriarchy. We have to dismantle capitalism. We have to dismantle white supremacy. We have to dismantle all of these systems because they're all so oppressive. It's just so tired because the reason that we even have people who are the more respectable, straight-laced, seeming out queer people today is because of the people who are willing to be the, the bold ones to kind of be in people's faces. That kind of boldness may have worked in our favor in the past. It's only working to our disadvantage now. The Jeffrey Marshes of the world. You think people like Jeffrey Marsh help us? You're, what is wrong with you? I mean, you that's, that's seriously messed up, okay? He's seen... He, people... I, I don't say this about him, but society sees him as, as a child diddler. Okay? That's how, that's how society sees him. And you're going to say, oh, yeah, he's good for the community. He's, what is wrong with you? Activists like you seem to have no idea of what the negative effects are of, of bad activism. You just don't care. 
You just don't care. You don't care how we're perceived. As long as you can perceive us as continuing to progress forward, um, you know, no matter how slow, as long as you can still perceive some form of that, um, it's all worth it to have our, our, our names and our, our entire community tarnished. Yeah, I mean, I, I skulk around conservative LGBT internet way more than I should because it's a, a form of self-harm for me at a certain point. Something that happens a lot there is this like revisionist history where people will say the goal of the gay rights movement was to assimilate into society. The goal was to be accepted by society in a way where we didn't have to worry anymore. That was the goal. That was the main goal. It wasn't this notion that we should completely dismantle society. It was the notion that we, sh we should be able to live in society in peace without being hassled by police. We should be able to go have our own establishments and not be p bothered by police and a bunch of shit like that. Okay, That was the original push of gay rights activism. You know, once you go beyond that, you're, you're, it's, it's not even about rights. It's about you wanting to force society to view people a particular way. And you're never going to get that totally. And I'm like, which gay rights movement are we talking about? Not the one that I'm familiar with. No, not the one that you're familiar with now. You're, you're young enough that you don't know what it was really like before. You weren't there. It's totally ahistorical. So before Pride Parades, before Stonewall, there were these events every year put together mostly by white cis gay men called the Annual Reminder Parades. And they started in the 50s and 60s. And they were, again, very cis male, very white. They would wear suits. They were very subdued. And they would just like march calmly in the streets saying, this is what gay people look like. Mm. See, we're normal like you. Accept us. And it didn't do anything. You know, I'll give you that. Uh, that was uh, being too peaceful, not wanting to cause any waves whatsoever. Yeah, that's probably not going to do anything. You need to cause at least some waves so you can at least get seen if, if your activism is going to work. But there is, there is a point where it flips and it goes the, the wrong way and people just view it negatively, right? So there, there's, there's a balance. It didn't score any political victories. It wasn't until Stonewall and fighting against the cops and this really diverse coalition of sex workers and trans people and queer people and homeless people all fighting the police that we actually started to see any kind of social gains. Well, one of the things is back then you were also fighting for your rights. You were genuinely fighting for your rights. You were fighting for your right to not be hassled and harassed by police. You were fighting for your right to be able to live without being, you know, beat up. You were fighting for actual rights. What are you fighting for now? So when people regurgitate that same logic now, so many decades later, it's just really sad. Your fights for your rights back then and being bold and being extreme back then to fight for your actual rights was totally different than the types of things people are fighting for now. Some of the things people are fighting for now, again, you, you want to dismantle, you know, all these different systems. But another thing is you want to control the way that people think of other people. It's no longer just about acceptance. It's no longer about a tolerance, which is all we can really ask for. Um, no, no, it's, it's about forcing people to view others a particular way. And that's just not going to fly. It's never going to fly. How would you describe respectability politics? I would say that respectability politics is the idea that if, as a member of a marginalized group, if you would only act correctly, you would somehow win the approval of the majority and no longer be oppressed. That it's on you as the individual to just somehow be the perfect type of queer person, of person of color, whatever it is to earn your right into assimilation. Herein lies the problem. You don't want to feel like you have to assimilate, and yet at the same time, you don't want to be treated as a freak. You can't have both things at the same time. The definition, according to Wikipedia, is the assimilation of LGBT or otherwise marginalized people based on sexuality or transgender status into a hegemonic and heteronormative society. Look, if you don't want to follow the rules, the roles, the standards, the values, the, the customs of, of the society you're in, then you can't expect to be treated as if you are doing those things. 
This can be achieved by downplaying stereotypes or behaviors associated with homosexuality, for example, cross-dressing or flamboyant dressing, public displays of same-sex affection, or participating in cisgender heterosexual institutions. Again, we can match all of these stereotypes to a T, right? We, we, can, we can just go full-blown on and at all the stereotypes, but we can't expect to be treated as if we don't have those stereotypes. And there is a version of respectability politics, I feel like, in every marginalized group. And I feel like every marginalized community has their own, like, infighting about this, right? Yeah, I think everybody internalizes that stigma, right, of what everyone from the outside says about your group. And you really don't want to live up to that stereotype, even though, actually, most of the time, those stereotypes, there's nothing wrong with them right? Like, what's the problem with being flaming? What's the problem with not wanting to get married, you know, and like having a million partners or whatever it is. We internalize that self-loathing and then we hate anybody in our own group that reminds us of what we're the most embarrassed about, about ourselves. Man, this, what you're pushing right there is a real pet peeve of mine. It's when gay men push the notion, or anyone in the LGBT community pushes the notion that Unless you are flamboyant, unless you do uh, celebrate everything feminine and, and shit all over everything masculine because it's considered, uh, you know, toxic masculinity, right? Unless you celebrate everything feminine, then uh, you're a self-loathing person, that, that you hate yourself, that it's all some, some you know, if, if you don't want to act feminine, well, it's, it's, it's you hate yourself, it's just bullshit. I really, really hate this this kind of mindset. It's 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 I don't know whether you could call it gaslighting or what, but it, it's it's fucked. Yeah, I mean, I feel like respectability politics. I mean, it's usually expressed in my experience on like through our judgment of people in our group. Right. And so in this case, LGBT people who we don't want to be associated with. Look, if you're at this point where you think that someone being even slightly annoyed at at flamboyance and and extreme femininity, if you're at the point where you think any any resistance to that at all is hate, then maybe what you're saying makes sense here. I don't know. But that's not how it actually works. Just because someone is annoyed at that at the way that someone acts sometimes, at someone's mannerisms or or whatever, um that doesn't mean they hate you. That doesn't mean they hate gay people. That doesn't mean they it, it, just, just some people can be annoyed. People are allowed to be annoyed. And so I feel like in queer communities, it's like this judgment that's levied against like very flaming and flamboyant gay men or queer people who are in kink communities, fat queer people, sex workers, drag queens, non-binary people, people who use neo pronouns, oftentimes autistic queer people. The list goes on. Where is this hatred within the LGBT community against those things? Usually it's people that are don't even want to consider themselves part of that community who have those sorts of feelings. So what are you referring to? There's almost the sense of like, if you're too frivolous, you don't deserve rights. What? That like queer rights are this very serious thing and we're trying to get these legal protections and get plugged into the legal existing, you know, cisgender heterosexual system. Man, the hate that's coming from you. Oh my God. But if you need a surgery that's like too weird of a surgery that we can't understand or the way you present is unprofessional, you don't really need to do that. Did, did you really just say that? Really? Do you? Like, can't you quiet it down while we're in public? You're equating strange surgeries with being flamboyant in public. What other things are you going to conflate together that you somehow in your mind think are the same thing? You're making us look bad. You're making us look bad. Again, being flamboyant and all of that isn't what makes people look bad. It's some of the opinions that come from people where you, you show that you absolutely hate a straight white society and the activism that comes from all over the place. Allies, I mean, you, you see it, it's, you see it pushed in elementary schools. It's just like, no, that, that doesn't belong there. We didn't, I didn't fight for my rights in the 90s, just to have it uh, now represent, uh, uh, oh, look, an eight-year-old can choose their gender. No. That is kind of, okay, hold on, I'm jumping the gun. So from your essay, a, a quote that I took from your essay was, I don't think any of us literally believe that the more irritating a person is, the more of a pressing political threat they are. 
but we behave as if they do. We devote huge amounts of time to complaining about the types of queer people that irritate us and develop complex taxonomies for describing why they are so annoying and why defeating that annoyingness matters. I feel like that's the whole thing, what you just said, right? They're making us look bad. The cringy queer TikToker is giving queers a bad look. You don't think activists saying that they hope that their kids turn out transgender is a bad look? Really? Drag queens being too in public or people at kink festivals. I don't think anyone really cares as long as you're not bringing kids. Try to get to the bottom of this. Like, do we have to cast out weird queers? If we do, I'm first to go. Again, the problem isn't weirdness. The problem isn't freakishness. The problem is when you want to either, you know, push this stuff onto kids or you want to dismantle all the systems that make up this society. You want to dismantle Western civilization because you deem it to be oppressive. So, <laughs> uh-oh, most of us are pretty weird. That, and that's the thing, too. It's like when you start scraping back, like, okay, who doesn't belong to any of the groups that are considered weird? It's like literally just Pete Buttigieg. Again, you seem to be under this strange impression that society does not accept that there are weird people out there. They may not, uh, you know, celebrate that, that person's weirdness, but they accept it, or at the very least, they tolerate it. And as I said before, tolerance is really the, all we can really ask for. As long as we're tolerated and people treat us decently, th th none, of, none of how they actually think of us should matter. Kind of to one of your points, like a lot of kids watch this content, a lot of queer kids or people who are just questioning their identity or coming into themselves, newly out people. And it's almost like this stage, I think for a lot of us, of identity development where you're trying to figure out what kind of person can I be? Having a lot of choices can be a good thing, but it also depends on how it's introduced to people. Mm. You know, what am I allowed to be and what am I not allowed to be? And so a lot of really impressionable people or people who are in like a really vulnerable spot, they see this stuff and then they say, oh, I can't be like these blue haired pronoun users. Like that's become such a thing that people literally do actually make decisions about what they do with their hair and their body based on not wanting to seem like the wrong kind of queer person. It shouldn't be that way, but, you know, they don't want to be seen as one of the crazy activists. And then, of course, conservatives lap it up, too. And it's like when we have these conversations, we're doing the work of conservatives for them mm. by saying more and more people are realizing they're trans online. Like the implication of that video is being trans is supposed to be weird and rare and there shouldn't be a lot of us. You know, that's like the unspoken premise of a lot of this stuff. Like these messages discourage more people from being queer. A lot of queer messaging stops people from wanting to come out of the closet as gay. So... And it's like, why? We see this so much from inside of the queer community, right? Like this judgment calls made about who is really queer and who is not really queer. Perhaps you shouldn't have turned it into an ideology to begin with, and then we wouldn't be having these problems. It's like they think acceptance is this like finite pie, and it's like, we can get being he himed or she heard, but if you ask to be zizim zerd, oh, that's going to ruin it all for all of us, because it's asking cishet people to do too much work. It is. I'm not going to be forced to memorize some bullshit made up something or other about someone every time I think of them. You do not have the right to dictate how other people think of you, period. And the project of queerness, I think, is for us to just kind of like flip everything over on its head. Yeah. And you think you should be respected for that shit? You think uh, everyone gay they should just be on board with this? Yes, let's turn everything upside down. Let's let's uh, let's flip all the the things that 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 has has historically been oppressive and just flip it on its head and have a, that that as the new hierarchy. No, no, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna I'm not gonna uh, go with that. Okay, the, the, society is not very bad on gay people or even trans people right now. We're one of the best countries still in the world for those sorts of issues and it's still not enough you want to turn everything on the fucking upside down you know like we want people to rethink how they think about gender and sexuality and um, gender roles and roles in relationships yeah and you want to dismantle the nuclear family you want to dismantle the traditional family you want to turn everything upside down and that's what it means to be queer apparently and you think that everyone who is under the LGBT umbrella should should just want to go with all that shit. No, 
No. And so it seems like to me, the more and more people we have that are just doing things their own freaky, queer way that we've never heard of before, that like helps really change the paradigm. That helps set all of us free. It's not a threat to us. If anything, the queer people that are more willing to be out there and do something that we've never heard of before, that is totally baffling, that makes us all question the like cishet conditioning that so much of us still have. Cishet conditioning. Okay, look. I was involved with the Radical Fairies for many years, since, since the mid-90s. And they had always talked about, you know, expanding a, a lot of uh, how we view a lot of things. Okay? But they didn't try to push that onto the mainstream. They did not try to make it mainstream. They knew that, this, hey, this is our, this is our thing, this is, this is our kind of our little club, or if you want to call it that, you know, if... You accept us, we'll accept you. Hey, this is cool, you know. But th this latest stuff is trying to push this stuff onto mainstream culture. It, it will never accept some of this stuff. Never, ever, ever. Keep it as your own little club. For the most part, there is no passing as non-binary still for most people. Like you're, if you use they, them, or if you use zizim, zir, you're pretty much going to have to correct people. You're going to have to assert yourself. Or just tolerate people being wrong. Well, when it comes to bun, bun, self, and star gender, and all that sort of BS from uh, uh, neo-genders, um, there's a chance you might be wrong, and it might not be uh, everyone else. The rest of the world is wrong, and you're the only right one. No, that, 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 yeah. And so, you might seem like a more annoying queer person. You are. It's not just a seeming. Uh, you are. If you're going around constantly correcting people on your pronouns, you are a very, very annoying person. Because you have to assert yourself. You don't, though. I mean, you internally can think of yourself as whatever random, whatever it is, right? But you pick, you pick one when it comes to dealing with society. Pick one. Pick a gender. Maybe it's not right, but you're not going to radically change society. Because there is no structure in place for you no there isn't and there's not going to be we put like this weird onus on queer people again to like kind of ask like do i really need this what do i need to make people understand about me and i don't think we get to ever decide for someone else what they need and what's like a life and death or even just like an important validating issue for them yes but it sometimes becomes a problem when your your own validation of yourself requires that everyone else validate you as well and yeah we get into a lot of trouble as a community when we act like okay being able to use a bathroom that aligns with your gender that's important because it's so you won't die but wearing an outfit that you feel comfortable in, if it's a little obnoxious, you don't really need that. You don't need that badly enough. That's not acceptable or whatever the case may be. Examples, anything, what are you talking about? I want to revisit Buck Angel really briefly. And now he's just like a Blair White. Like he's just doing conservative social media. Like we have to stop the crazy woke TikTok teens from like making our community look too bad. Like, dude. This isn't just all about making the community look bad. It's about what it does to society. Actually giving a shit about what actions and what dismantling all these different things does to society. You know, you don't seem to care. You seem to think society is invincible because, oh, we've, we've come this far. Now we just flip everything upside down. It's stupid. <sighs> Whatever. All right. In preparing for this episode, I was going through all of these people's YouTube channels and... Again, with him as well as the rest of them, it's the same video over and over again. Reacting to cringy queers on TikTok. Like, oh my God, you are like 40 fucking years old. You should not be reacting to cringy TikTok teens. You should be going to the theater. I think these stupid ideas need to be called out. If, if they're not called out, then more people will cling to them thinking they're reasonable ideas. A lot of this stuff is just absolute tripe. I wish they could call it out more on, on TikTok itself, but, you know, they, they have some policies where if, if you're mean to someone or if they say you're being mean to them, they can have your video or channel taken down. So, you know, you don't have people really uh, making that many uh, uh, response videos on that platform, but you do see them on, uh, on YouTube, you do see them on BitChute, you do see them on Rumble. So, but I think this stuff needs to be called out, you know? Uh, it's it's sad that the people who really need to see it aren't going to see it. Somebody needs to remind him that 
being trans was considered a mental illness until a couple of years ago. That being gay was considered a mental illness. So if you're trying to say yeah. you're crazy for being a part of these groups, that's what's going to be said about all of us. And has been said about all of us. Well, I mean, what if it's true? What if being homosexual or having gender dysphoria are mental disorders? Does it mean we should be treated poorly? I mean, there isn't any real evidence that we're born this way. There's, I mean, the closest thing I can think of is uh, that uh, gay men uh, prefer male pheromones to female pheromones. There's an attraction just to the pheromones, you know, but does, is that, does that really prove it? I don't know. But uh, um, yeah, there, there's a chance that uh, it might not be the way we're born. You know, it could be some way that uh, could be some things that we experience and it's a mental reflex, a mental reflex to certain certain stimuli or a, a mental reflex to a lack of very important stimuli. It could be a number of things. But even if it is an actual mental disorder, that doesn't mean we should be treated poorly. It doesn't mean we should be removed from society. It just means that uh, we should probably uh, tackle a number of these issues a little differently than we've been. All of our identities have been pathologized as mental illness at some point in the very recent history. And also like, oh, you need help, so I'm going to just bully you. I'm going to just bully teens online. I haven't seen Buck Angel bully people. I haven't seen that. I have seen some some other people that they I, I'd consider that bullying, but not Buck Angel. That's going to help them. That's going to protect the community. Yeah. How does scrutinizing that protect anyone? Yeah, no, the only thing you're helping is, is once again, your Google AdSense account. You're acting as though anyone who is under the LGBT umbrella is a grifter if they speak out against anything that they're seeing going on. I, it just strikes me how like people like this, they've cut off everyone in the, their own community so much that all they have left after they do that is to pander to the conservatives. What's sad is that if you are under the LGBT umbrella, you are expected to believe in a very specific set of things or you are ostracized from the community. Like, that's, that's the ultimate sadness of it. Like, I think we can resent them for running this grift and making a living out of exposing, like, young teens. Like, that's absolutely vile. But it's also just so pathetically sad that, like, there are very few places that the Ariel Scarcellas can go anymore, at, among other queer people. Like, it's such a lonely existence, and they're just licking the boot of the cishet people now for the rest of their lives like that's all they can do because they're so isolated so instead someone should pretend to believe differently let's pretend everyone let's pretend let's pretend that we believe eight-year-olds can choose their gender let's pretend all these different bullshit neo-genders are they're real everyone let's make all this let's pretend let's pretend all this stuff so we can have friends let's pretend so we can have friends no i'm not interested in that if that if if telling the truth means I'm going to lose friends then I'm going to lose friends. I've already like just a lot of friends of mine have died over the past couple years so you know whatever. Yeah, and then whenever you say something to that effect they'll always turn it around and be like, "Well, whatever happened to the tolerant left queer community?" Yeah, where is the tolerant queer community? It's not. The queer community is not tolerant. The LGB community is pretty tolerant. And, and they use it as further reason to like, well, I don't associate with the queer community anymore because I expressed some questions and now they don't want anything to do with me. And it's like, yeah, your questions were like fucking bullying 14 year old non-binary kids on TikTok. Like, correct. I don't want anything to do with you. Well, that was quite the straw man, wasn't it? The only people who are ever saying whatever happened to the tolerant left are like people who just are expressing the most vile viewpoints that I don't feel the need to tolerate. And also just side note on like tolerance, my goal personally, and I won't speak for other queer people, I won't speak for people on the left. My goal is not uninhibited tolerance. And I don't know how you feel about this, but like my goal is liberation for my people. We are a small percentage of the population. We're a small, what is it, 5% when it comes to LGB, and uh, and when it comes to transgender, it's less than 1%. I, we, we make up a very small percentage. We're, we're not going to have this social liberation where everything is going to revolve around us. No. Okay, we, we, live, we do live in a patriarchal, uh, white supremacist, uh, 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 Christian society. We do. That's that's where we're at. We have there's a certain kind of hierarchy we've got. There's 
there's there's certain values, roles, rules, standards. There's all this stuff. We've got these. We're we're not going to turn the country upside down to make ourselves feel better. It's not the right way. Yeah, there's a big difference between tolerance and actual political gains where we actually have power. Power. So it's all about power, huh? It's not about it's not about tolerance. It's not about being treated well. No, it's about power. And I think that's is where it breaks down that a lot of these respectability politics, queer people, they want to just lobby for the straights to approve of us and tolerate us. Yes, because that's the most we can ask for. If we expect if we expect all this power and all this this forced acceptance and everyone to pretend they believe something when they don't. Yeah, it's not. It just sucks, man. It sucks. They don't actually want us to have enough power to be a threat to the cishet system. We have no business trying to topple the cishet system. And I think that's what a lot of us are actually gunning for, is for us to actually have the ability to change society in really dramatic ways and like reclaim our power. And you think society should be tolerant of that? Tolerant of just being just turned upside down? And yeah, that is more scary. So we actually don't need all the cishets to like us. It might actually be to our credit if sometimes they feel a little uncomfortable, a little scared, a little annoyed. Like that actually might be where our power lies. Mm. No, it's going to be the downfall of the LGBT movement. It's going to be what people are going to use against us in the future. But you don't care. You, you, think, you think we're still on this forward trajectory. We're about to have a pendulum swing the other way really hard. Good job.